Thank you very much, Chris. Um, just confirming that I'm audible. I think so. Yeah. And I thank you very much. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in our seminar today. And in fact, given the way that we're delivering this seminar, I would like to extend that respect to any Indigenous peoples who are um, present in the seminar when you are viewing this. So with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's seminar. Uh, the talk today is the groundwater monitoring in California's Central Valley using satellite remote sensing. And the speaker is uh, Chandrakanta Oja, who has joined GA uh, earlier this year. So it's a very new topic and we're excited about having uh, you hear this today. Uh, Chandra is an INSAR scientist who received his master's from the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay in 2011 and his PhD from the University of Rome in 2015. From 2012 to 2016, Chandra was a research fellow at IREA CNR in Italy. And then he went to the Arizona State University from 2016 to 2019. And the work that you'll be hearing about today um, is, was uh, undertaken in the period of time that he was in the US. So please join me in welcoming Chandra today. And uh, Chandra, over to you for giving your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, and uh, thank you all the audience um, for attending this uh, seminar talk. So um, I'm Chandrakant Ojha. Um, the talk of the presentation is um, groundwater monitoring in California's Central Valley using uh, satellite remote sensing. I joined GA on um, February of this year, um, 2020. So this research is, um, is about um, my activities during um, my uh, research work in the United States. But many of you might have um, wondering why I'm discussing it about California when I am in Australia. There is a saying in um, French philosophy by a French philosopher, um, the scientist is the person who is not give the right answer. He's the one who asks the right questions. So I'm trying to justify and um, through this, um, by the end of the presentations, I'd like to uh, give a sense of um, what I'm talking about. So let's start by um, going to um, through our slides. Um, so um, coming to a very fundamental questions, how did we on the earth get so lucky? It turns out that um, to whom I'm asking for, asking to. I hope everyone will be okay and to um, to, um, to agree um, on this point that we have a livelihood on the earth. And this is because of um, the continuous changes in the climate, variation in natural variability, and the ongoing human activities. All three basic factors are interlinked and has associated with each other. Over exploitations of any of the factors has an important, um, has significantly impact to our ecosystem. And one of the important factors uh, that affected is um, the groundwater flow, the groundwater flow all across the globe. So the figure here shows a global perspective of the freshwater flows across the regions from 2002 to 2016. The figure here shows a global perspective all across the regions. However, if we focus on uh, Northern American regions, in particular the United States, you can see the, uh, the groundwater flow is significant on these regions. And it is easy to uh, monitor and to understand the response of the, the freshwater flows over a larger scale. But if you look at very local scale, it is quite difficult to monitor in such a uh, regional scale. And that is the big issue and the challenges and the current time 
to monitor the groundwater or the underground water flows using um, the available data or um, many other factors. And that could include um, uh, related to the unavailability data, um, issues related to the underground data, or some policy making issues. So to address some of these issues, we focus on a very small areas in California, which has a stressed aquifer systems we call Central Valley of California. And to use a high tech satellite remote sensing technique, understanding and monitoring the groundwater flows in these regions. So in that context, um, my presentation is focused on a Central Valley of California, which is one of the largest agricultural uh, land in the United States which covers more than 50,000 square kilometer area. It produced 200 different crops across um, the country, which is um, equivalent to 17 billion from every year. But, but unfortunately, the land has been affected by several droughts last few decades. As a result, it shows a groundwater volume loss all across the valley. If we see the figure on the bottom, the right um, bottom, the Central Valley shows a negative decline of groundwater storage last several decades. And it causes a permanent loss of aquifer storage capacity. And because of this over exploitations of this groundwater leads to a larger subsidence in the regions. We can clearly notice the largest subsidence in the different periods. This middle figure shows from 1955 to 1977, how much the land has been subsided. And it's still continuing. We can see even 1980s to 2016, 1965 to 2013. This subsidence also causes um, damage to the infrastructures. Understanding the, uh, the dynamics of the groundwater depletions and how it actually um, works or to and understand the, um, the way how we can estimate the groundwater dynamics, let's go with a simple um, example. The figure on the left, it shows um, a cartoon uh, representing a water table where this building is represents an infrastructure. The water in pour holds the grains apart and keep the pores open. But over a period of time, when the water has been used for agriculture purpose or for many other purpose, the water table goes down. As a result, the land has, um, has subsided and causes infrastructure damages to this building here. And this removal of art uh, removal of water, uh, water allows pores to collapse and increase the effective pressure. And this effective pressure has a direct relations with the, uh, the, um, the subsidence, the land subsidence, which we can use in a geophysical model to estimate groundwater volume or the, the volume loss in this region. There are two important factors and deformation is associated with such per elastic um, deformation. One of the important one is elastic deformation, which is basically associated to the seasonal per elastic deformations. It uh, relates to offlift when we recharge and a subsiding when we discharge the water from the, um, from the underground. Another important factor is an inelastic deformations. So when the, um, so this is called a permanent compactions of the aquifer layer, of the, due to the aquifer layers. So the, when the fine grain compacts permanently, it cannot at the stage of recovery backs. Sometimes when the land um, goes below a pre-consolidations level, we, the, uh, we, we, um, we say the land goes to a permanent compactions. This information um, can be estimated um, using uh, different techniques. And one of the most efficient techniques that we use for estimating such deformation is INSAR-based um, subsidence monitoring. And with that, my outline of my presentation is to investigate 
the large scale deformations using INSAR as satellite, high tech satellite remote sensing techniques over the Central Valley. And to understand and estimate the ground wall groundwater volume loss and aquifer storage loss during two recent drought periods across the Central Valley using not only INSAR, but an alternate methods like GRACE remote sensing and to validate the INSAR with the GRACE water storage validations. And last, last not but least, to understand the implication of this groundwater monitoring tools in the context of um, Australian aquifer system. Giving an overview of the fundamentals of INSARTS, when the satellite moves um, along its track, it acquires an image of the ground. It sent signals and recovered, uh, received the backscatter signals and recalled a single low complex image, which contains both the phase and amplitude information of the backscatter signals. But over a period of time, when the, when the land subsides from its original positions, it acquired another um, backscatter signals and combining the phase difference between um, both the images, it gives an, a color fringe uh, image we call an interferogram. And this interferogram has an information associated to the deformations of this um, building or the infrastructure or the surface along the, the flight directions. The figure here shows a single interferogram, but when we have a more number of interferograms over different period of times, we combine together to estimate a deformation velocity across the regions. And for each and every pixel in the regions, we can estimate a time series evolution. Coming to the Central Valley of California, uh, the figure on the top shows um, a drought indicator of California across the Californias. So the color, different color shows the extremities of the, the classification of the drought from abnormally dry to the exceptional drought as shows here on this level. But the most significant is on the Southern part of the California. So we call the San Joaquin Valleys and the, the bottom part actually the column shows um, the drought indicator during uh, two different periods, um, 2007, 2009, and 2012, 2016. And in this talk, we are going to understand and to estimate the groundwater volume loss for each and every uh, drought period. Coming to the first drought period, 2010, uh, 2007, 2010, we, we use our um, INSAR uh, datas that is, in this case, we have available ALUS Pulsar satellite data that was um, one of the largest um, satellite launched by Japan uh, space agencies, where we have an available 420 SAR images um, all across the Central Valley, which has a size of several terabytes across the regions. And we use such a um, huge amount of data and process through an efficient multi-temporal INSAR methods to estimate the surface deformation velocity. We use the surface deformation velocity and we use uh, some external component like GPS and other measurements to remove the horizontal component and convert it back to the, um, to the vertical velocity estimations. So the figure on the left shows the deformation velocity um, along the vertical directions. And we can clearly notice the vertical deformation signal. It's prominent on the southern part of the central valley where the maximum source about more than 20 centimeter of deformation velocity during this drought period. We have available about 1600 groundwater head label across the Central Valley. The color on the right shows uh, the total cumulative groundwater um, label data um, on different regions. The dark color on the southern part of the valley shows um, greater than more than 30 meter of head level change and which is more significant on the southern part compared to the northern part. If we look the time series of uh, some of the um, wells, we can clearly see this uh, negative decline of groundwater label, which is in this case is more than uh, 40 meters subside for this particular 
head level which also associated with some seasonal um, change in the head level chain head uh, well data however in northern um, part of the central valley we can see a groundwater level change but it's not that significant as compared to the southern part of the valley if we look at the 3d profile uh, between the insar based and the groundwater level data we can clearly see the the significant deformations on the southern of uh, southern part of the central valley which is in the range between 20 to 25 cm per year per year during the drought periods compared to the northern part of the valley which is between 3 to 5 cm per year and it it correlates to the groundwater level change that the groundwater level actually is responsible for the subsidence using such information with insar based deformations and the head level and we put into a geophysical model understanding a different mechanical properties including the groundwater volume loss and some of the properties i'm showing here is one of the important is to understand the inelastic storage coefficients this is an important factors to understand the inelastic storativity in the regions and this red color shows a larger inelastic um, storage um, factors in the central valley using this inelastic surface deformations we and the head level changes we can estimate and we can calculate uh, the aquifer storage loss from this expressions in this regions we have not evolved the the thickness of the central valley um, all across the central valley so we choose a variable um, thickness of the central valley for estimating the aquifer storage loss and we come up with about 2% total loss during this drought periods and the maximum percentage is from the southern part of the central valley and using this informations this in elastic deformations we come up with a groundwater volume storage loss and that shows about 70% of the total um, aquifer storage loss is in particular from the central valley and the total storage loss was 21 uh, plus 7 cubic of volume loss cubic kilometer volume loss so this result shows that the significant deformations and the water volume losses experienced in the southern part of the valley so keeping that in mind we further investigate the next drought period that is 2012 2015 that we call the millennium to the largest drought period in the central valley where we have more number of um, uh, data uh, available in the archive where we use for the insar a sentinel one um, data the sentinel one data is, is um a two constellation satellite that was um deployed um launched by european space agency so if we look here uh, it has a full coverage all across the globe and we use this data during the period 2015 until uh, end of 2017 october 2017 we have also many uh, groundwater um, uh, head level data and some ground measurements like gps and extensiometers are available for understanding the response of the aquifer systems and the groundwater changes if you look at the groundwater um, head level changes in this region we can see the darker spot on the uh, on the center of this uh, on the southern part of the valley which has um, groundwater head level changes more than 30 meter during this drought period and if we look the time series over some of the uh, locations um, the head level change we can see the drought phases that is start from 25 2012 until uh, 2015 has a more than 50 meter of head level changes and from 2015 onward it's quite stable and at stage of recovery it is diff However, um, looking the insar vertical deformations from processing from the sentinel data, um, you can see the uh, the evolution of the deformation um, all across the central valley, um, all across the southern part of the San Joaquin Valley, and a fifty centimeter of deformation is showing on uh, particularly in the central part of the San Joaquin Valley regions. If you look the velocity across the regions, it shows more than twenty-five centimeter per year in these regions, and the time series shows a faster subsidence from twenty fifteen to twenty seventeen, and from twenty seventeen onwards a slow subsidence. You know the integration of the results; it's a state of art. 
the interpretation of the result is challenging. If we compared the head label and the INSAR, we can see um, the INSAR results showing a subsidence during the phase of post drought. And we do not have INSAR data available during the drought phase. So that we cannot use here um, for groundwater well estimations. Instead, we use a GPS made, made, uh, based uh, deformation um, um, results for groundwater loss during this period. And we come up with several um, mechanical properties. And it shows about 29 cubic kilometer volume loss during such period. Giving a, a quick comparisons between two different, prot, uh, two different drought periods, we can clearly see the, 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 uh, the latest one shows a larger subsidence compared to the previous uh, drought 2007, 2010. And it's, if looking at the volume loss, it shows 21 cubic volume loss during this period and about 30 um, cubic volume loss which is equivalent to 3% of aquifer storage loss during this period and 2% during 2007. And altogether, it shows a cumulative aquifer storage loss of 5%. INSAR is an alternate way of, um, INSAR is not directly used for estimating the uh, groundwater loss, but it gives the surface deformation. But we combine with different other, um, um, geodetic techniques, uh, geodetic data to estimate the groundwater loss. But there is an alternative methods that is particularly dedicated for understanding the uh, total water storage variations. And we, most of you know, it's um, gray satellite. In, in short, it's called gravity recovery and climate experiment. This is um, satellite uh, was launched on, um, Early 2002, it is jointly sponsored by uh, NASA and German Aerospace Center DLR. This is a near polar orbit, which is an inclination of uh, 89 degrees. The two satellites, um, the twin satellites, actually um, are separated at a distance of 220 kilometers and is um, moving um, over the polar orbit. It sends a microwave signals uh, to the ground to receive the, the um, rate change at the distance. And as um, it sent uh, inter, um, inter satellite distance between them. The satellites has um, equipped with accelerometer and the GPS for understanding the non-gravitational accelerations as well as um, accurate position measurements. Combining such informations, it produce an average gravitational field. So this satellite is basically designed to understand the um, gravitational variations all across the um, all across the globe which has a direct relations with the mass change and that is in particular the water mass changes across the globe and uh, this great satellites um, gives a monthly average of a gravitational um, field um, a monthly average of gravitational field across the globe. And figure on the right shows um, a, um, a gravitational field map across the regions. There are different agencies are um, particularly using um, GRACE data, uh, GRACE data understanding um, volume loss um, or the total water storage calculations. And here, in this case, we use a JPL-based uh, mass concentration status to estimate, um, to get um, total water storage, total water storage across the regions. The total water storage is, consists of different components, including the groundwater data. It has associated with some other hydraulic data. So to estimate the groundwater loss from this total water loss is a simple way to discard the other components like surface water, uh, snow, uh, uh, soil moistures, or the snow storage. For those data, we can use a, a different models. Um, there are currently different models are available, but among the scientific community to um, have um, many discussions to understand the accuracies of the different model. But um, using a very conventional uh, model-based approach, we can 
uh, estimate different um, component like surface water, ice and soil moisture component and remove from the total water storage to get the groundwater volume loss. So here, uh, the figure on the left shows a footprint of the gray satellite across the central valley, which covers about more than 200 uh, kilometers square. So in this case, we use um, a JPL mask, a JPL mask con concentrations of label three data, whose uh, um, special resolutions covers um, three degree, which is equivalent to 300 by three kilometer data. So um, the figure in the, uh, the left corner shows uh, two, uh, two tiles actually covering the entire central valley. The green uh, pixel actually representing the center of the, um, each tile. We applied a scaling factor of a 0.5 degree to, um, to estimate a real estimation of the water mass balance within the cell. And we integrate those to estimate the groundwater uh, storage loss in this region. The unit that we generally use as a um, equivalent uh, water height. To understanding the long-term um, storage loss, um, here uh, the figure on the top, it shows about the hydrological data um, for the different components. And we can clearly notice the soil moisture component um, has a more dominating factor compared to the other two factors in this region. And such data can be removed from the total water storage to estimate the groundwater volume loss. In this case, the blue color actually shows the uh, groundwater storage loss. We uh, extracted uh, the train um, for two different drought period, and we calculate the total volume loss. And for the first drought period, we estimate about 35 QV kilometer loss, which shows pretty good agreement with the previous um, measurements done from Scan, uh, Scanlon et al. to 2012. For the second drought, which actually shows almost twice compared to the uh, first one, but the previous one. But the inside, um, the uh, grace is always giving a large scale perspective of the groundwater volume loss. But the question has always come how we can compact the gray space measurement, which is um, whose spatial resolution is uh, 300 and 300 kilometers square, with uh, local um, scale resolutions like INSAR, which is several meter. To address such issues, we investigate by undersampling or uh, downscaling the INSAR data equivalent to the grace resolutions. So that shows, uh, so figure here shows um, insert data. And we undersample equivalent to grace resolutions. And here is the um, downscale of the insert equivalent to the grace resolutions. And comparing both grace space um, measurement and downsample of insert equivalent to the grace footprint, we can see the total water storage is comparable. And it shows a good agreement between insert and the grades with some uncertainties. But if you look the uh, local scale, the INSAR is showing a clear distinction between northern tile and the southern tile. And the southern tile experiencing more groundwater loss, which is actually 81% of the total um, groundwater storage loss. If you look at the gray state, which is totally indistinguishable between the both slides, and that is a kind of a drawback for the grace when we are looking for a local scale approach. Giving a comparison for the, um, for the different regions during different drought periods, um, for the first drought, 2007-2009, INSAR and GRACE shows a good agreement between both the results with some uncertainties. And for the, for the second drought that we investigate for the San Joaquin Valley, we estimate the GPS-based, um, we use the GPS-based deformations data, which is not um, fully covered or fully captured the signals caused of the sparsely data available across the space, which lacks uh, volume loss. So that's why we call this a lower bound estimates. And the grace maskons um, 
using particular uh, is not able to discriminate between two, two tiles. So it's um, so it's a source and underestimation of the volume loss. But if we compare, if we apply a north-south signal distributions derived from the INSA data, we can estimate a southern um, cell um, a volume loss of about 20, 20, 48 cubic volume. But the rough estimations using the signal distributions is different um, from second drop to the first drop. In spite of the difference in the special resolutions between the INSAR and the GRACE, in spite of the difference of way of uh, estimating the, the groundwater loss between the INSAR and GRACE, INSAR and GRACE is combiningly will give a complete picture or a clear picture of understanding uh, the groundwater volume in any stress aquifer regions. In that context, in recent years, the groundwater volume loss is an important issue has been discussed significantly among um, the print and digital medias. Um, giving a more attention to the print and digital medias. And here are some of the um, news that has been discussing about the groundwater issues in different part of the um, different part of the Australia. However, if you're looking at the groundwater usage um, uh, last few Several, uh, last several years in Australia, we can notice a significant increase of um, the groundwater uses different uh, part of the um, Australia. And that is gradually increasing to a water risk in all across Australia. We can clearly see the, the, the dark colors. It's, um, it's extremely high risk, uh, John, for the water risk in future. And that's giving an alarm to investigate the groundwater in different um, aquifer basins all across Australia. So in that context, uh, Geoscience Australian groundwater team combined um, collaborating with other teams and other uh, stakeholder and research organizations to investigate um, and are currently working on a gap project to understand the response of uh, um, groundwater volume in, uh, in, um, in Great Artesian Basin, which is one of the largest aquifer system in Australia. And in my uh, research on Central Valley will give uh, an, an interesting perspective to understand the, um, the groundwater volume loss in these regions. And, and the important outcome uh, will have a tremendous um, value to the policymakers, the managers, local communities living in the stressed regions and health mitigating um, future groundwater volume loss in those regions. So in that, the, my conclusions, uh, the concluding remarks, well, the INSAR will provide an alternate method for estimating the groundwater variations. Large scale subsidence um, reflects value wide changes in groundwater stories during the different drought periods all across the Central Valley. INSAR and Grace based estimates shows in a good agreement for understanding the groundwater response or estimating the groundwater volume loss with a respective uncertainties. Last but not least, this demonstrated method has a great potential understanding the groundwater response in different stressed aquifer systems all across Australia. So I hope everyone will um, agree to a statement we can say that you cannot manage what you can measure. So with that, I will conclude my presentations. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Chandra. I hope you'll agree with me that that was an incredibly interesting presentation. And I think we can all see how great uh, the potential is of using such techniques to, to measure what's going on outside in a country where water is so incredibly important, as it is in California and in Australia, as you said. Um, so with that, um, I'm opening the floor to any questions. If you could put those in your chat, then we'll pass them um, on to Chandra. And um, anticipating questions from the audience, I'm going to start getting my own in, as is always the prerogative of the uh, 
the chair. Um, could I, uh, Chandra, could I ask you, to, uh, did this work get um, published and what was the reaction from uh, the government on the kind of data that this made available? Can you comment on that, please? Yeah. Thank you, Martin, for this question. Yeah, this, um, this research has been published in different uh, scientific journal um, for different periods, uh, for two different drought periods. And it took a lot of attention among the um, water managers and were very much interested understanding and interested to further monitoring um, such regions. And were also very much interested to, to investigate um, um, groundwater issues in a different part of the United States, apart from the Central Valley of California, which is quite significant. So it gives a lot of attention among the scientific community, as well as in the press and media, as well as for the policymakers. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I see some questions coming in. Uh, so first a question from Eamon. To what extent do these techniques discriminate between shallower and deeper aquifers? Chandra. Yeah, so uh, at this moment, we are actually uh, focusing on uh, shallow aquifer systems. For deeper aquifer systems, we need to have more understanding about the elast poor elastic modeling that we can apply. So uh, currently we are focusing on the shallow aquifer systems. Okay, Eamon, does that answer your question sufficiently? Or if not, add a comment in the chat. Um, I'll go to the next question, which comes from Paul Tregoning. Um, nice talk, which I agree with. Uh, there was a significant difference in the GPS subsidence rate and in the INSA rate in Central Valley. Any idea why? Uh, um, yeah, thank you so much for uh, the questions. Actually, the deformation signal uh, showing through the GPS is not exactly the same location from the um, from the insert. So, and uh, when we estimate the deformation signals, we have to estimate with respect to a reference um, uh, GPS stations, and that was an, actually uh, not exactly the same location. So that shows a kind of a difference between uh, both uh, signals. So, is that my um, answer to your question? Okay, thanks. Uh, the next question, they're coming in thick and fast. Um, um, the next question is from Negin Mogadam, who's in um, DA. When comparing the INSAR observation with the groundwater in situ measurements, as well as GRACE, how do you manage the LOS observation of INSAR? So did you eliminate the horizontal components of INSAR, or did you take advantage of, viewing, of the viewing geometry in ALOS Pulsar? That's very technical. Uh, yeah. So, um, so uh, the ALOS results gives us um, uh, deformations along the line of sight. Then we use the uh, GPS component to discard the uh, the um, GPS displacement to discard the horizontal component, and we convert it to um, a vertical component of deformations. And that vertical deformations uh, use with the um, with the head level change. And we combine those for in geophysical model to estimate uh, uh, different mechanical properties. Okay. So Thank we use you. yeah. So yeah. we use actually different um, groundwater uh, ground data for um, removing some of the signals from the insert based measurement measurements, and we convert it into a vertical component. Yeah. But right. there are many other alternative methods that we can use. But as this we ha as we have available different groundwater data, so in the uh, um, uh, ground data, so um, we use some of the data for cross validations as well as discarding some of the signals that we assume is not significant in our analysis. Okay, thank you. Uh, question from Chris: Can you comment on how much local calibration of aquifer properties is needed to estimate loss of groundwater volume? And a follow-up question: I'll throw them both at you. Uh, could INSAR be used to provide better estimates of groundwater extraction in well-studied areas like the Murray-Darling Basin? Um, um, coming to the directly to the second question, um, INSAR is always giving a local um, uh, local scale information. So, uh, um, INSAR it's always good to have understanding the uh, local scale perspective. Um, so, um, 
in context of um, my darling, I have no idea on that particular regions, but I hope if we have the insert and I'm sure we'll have the insert data coverage over the regions, will definitely give more insight into those uh, um, about the groundwater estimation on those regions in a local scale. And um, coming to the first questions, is it um, about uh, Calibration, I think, I don't remember. Yeah, it's, uh, can you comment on how much local calibration of aquifer properties is needed to estimate loss of groundwater volume? Yeah, uh, at this moment, I didn't put the slide, but if you are interested, you can refer my um, paper um, that I recently published, so where we have a detailed information about each and every components of um, aquifer properties. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, then a question from Tom. Chandra men mentioned horizontal movements in the Central Valley. Which magnitude do they have and at which locations do they occur? Um, which magnitude? Actually, it was um, not that significant. I don't remember which magnitude it was. Um, and um, the horizontal motion was neglected because we expected um, the vortic comp component is more significant because of the groundwater um, depletions. So um, I don't remember the measurement, uh, the magnitude of the horizontal component at this moment. Yeah, but I certainly can refer uh, the paper um, to check how much the horizontal component, and probably it's um, um, not in the Central Valley regions, but um, on the on, on the boundary of the Central Valley. Let's say on um, Sierra Nevada regions. Okay, thanks. And uh, then the next question from Phil. Great talk. Chandra said there is a small elastic component of the substance. Did INSAR detect recovery of that part, i.e. the uplift, after the drought, or is that too small? Yeah, this is a very, quite, uh, very good question. Uh, yes, INSAR also um, detect um, some um, offlet uh, signal. Um, uh, if you can see uh, some of my time series where we can see um, uh, a slightly offlift uh, during a uh, rain seasons, that uh, maybe are questionable for um, from the interpretation point of view. Um, but yeah, INSAR can also um, uh, technically can uh, measure um, offlift signals yeah, for the groundwater recovery. Okay, the next question from Madhya Razegi. Nice talk. To calculate the uh, GWS, you didn't subtract vegetation water, uh, the canopy, uh, through the canopy from uh, the TWS. Is there any reason why? Yeah, we didn't consider that one. We thought that component is not significant, so we use only uh, snow water and surface water as well as soil moisture component for estimations. But certainly we can use that if we have some data. Yeah. Okay, and another question from Paul. The JPL mask on surface area is much larger than the Central Valley, which is an oh, sorry, which is nestled within. How do you address the fact that the Grace estimate of total water storage is sampling more than just the Central Valley signals? Yeah, that is a great question. Yeah, it is um, always a challenging and difficult. So the data available for um, from the grace was um, um, label three data, which um, was also corrected with um, coastal resolution filters um, for uh, some leakage error uh, across the um, boundary. Um, um, so um, that's a kind of uncertainties uh, we noticed a bit uh, significant for uh, the first um, uh, during the first drought while comparing with the INSAR. So that's uh, with the GRACE and the INSAR. And there we can more predict and can more rely on the INSAR based measurement because we discover all across the Central Valley. Whereas uh, the GRACE actually has a bit larger uh, footprint compared to, um, uh, to the INSAR, um, uh, INSAR scale. So yeah, there will be some, some, uh, some sort of uncertainties, but um, INSAR plays an alternate role to, to validate with the GRACE measurements. Yeah. And it's easy to interpret understanding the response of the regions during that period. Okay, great, thank you. Next question from Luyan. Interesting presentation. How did you compute volume loss from GRACE and INSAR? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so it's, it's a, um, 
volume loss is like area into height. So if you know the, um, the deformation signals, the vertical deformations of the um, uh, aquifer compaction due to the aquifer compactions, we can put that um, um, into the area you are studying. And that's the equations I was showing uh, during the volume loss estimations. Yeah, it's a very simple um, calculations that we can use uh, the height changes due to the elastic compactions in this case and multiply with the areas um, over the study region. Okay, thanks. Then the next question from Snowy, does mass movement, landslides, erosion, etc., have a significant effect on the INSA results? Um, lens, and so in the context of Central Valley, um, not sure about how much landslide actually is affected. I think not that significant, but definitely for regions where we have a landslides, um, INSA can able to measure even the landslide deformations. Yeah. And that can also easy to interpret. Okay, thank you. I think I see the questions uh, slowing down. If there are any more questions, then please put them in now. Um, and if nothing is coming through, then uh, I'm going to uh, wrap this up by again, thanking you for a great presentation, Chandra. Very interesting. And I think uh, everybody, the number of questions and it uh, shows how engaged uh, we found this presentation and, and that everybody is very excited about the potential that this indicates. And we look forward to seeing what will happen in this field in um, Australia and at GA, of course, where we are actively um, undertaking this work with a number of partners across the states, territories and Commonwealth government. Uh, I then want to finish this uh, webinar today by giving a plug for next week's seminar. And that will also be given by somebody from the positioning uh, the National Positioning Infrastructure Branch. Next week, we'll hear from uh, Mike Moore and he will give a DGAL presentation, which is uh, titled Cloudy with a Chance of Noise. And this will cover the developments at GA of a GPS-based system to improve atmospheric moisture analysis in real time. And this is used to uh, improve the real-time weather forecasting system in Australia uh, at the Bureau of Meteorology in collaboration with GA. So looking forward to that seminar as well. And in the meantime, thank you very much for attending and we hope to see you again next week. Over to you, Chris, and next week.